you have to think why is the average life of someone who was in the sex industry or shot yeah. pornography 37 versus what did you say 78 yeah like that's insane yeah. that's a yeah. huge jump Welcome back to Three Girls, One Kitchen. On today's episode, we're discussing a topic that is near and dear to my heart, the dark side of pornography. In this episode, I will be sharing my personal and sometimes painful experience in the adult industry with you. So I wanted to issue a trigger warning for self-harm and people who have suffered sexual abuse as those topics may come up in this episode. With that said, let's start on a lighter note. I want to start incorporating life updates into our episodes because not only do people want to hear about the topics that we have, they want to hear about us. So we haven't shot for two weeks because me and Olivia were in New York. Does anyone? Yeah, yeah, we left our baby Alexa (laughs) behind. Does either of you have anything interesting to share that's happened over the past two weeks? I'm like, well, you were with me. (laughs) I'm like, honestly, I legit was working out every day sometimes two times a day and doing absolutely nothing else i was just exploring nature to be honest going on hikes went really to the beach yeah any shrooms involved in that <sighs> by myself no no. <laughs> no um i didn't even yeah nothing exciting i do wish i had weed but i didn't oh i have some if you want it oh yeah let's, on it. let's hit that doobie after this. yeah doobie <laughs> i haven't heard that phrase in a long time <laughs> what were we up to yeah God, um, I feel like everything was a blur. I feel like we were gone for so long that I don't remember because we went to New York first, then end up going to Chicago to get your dog. Then we're stuck in Chicago and then end up driving to New York, which is insane. People yeah, actually we went on a little road trip. Yeah, um, we stayed in a motel. That was kind of cool. <laughs> me and Olivia got in a fight because I wanted to see waterfalls and she didn't. <laughs> we got in a fight over hypothetical <laughs> theories. Um, turns out she doesn't like hypothetical <clears throat> theories or mine, at least. Um, we got in a couple fights. Just, like, little arguments. Yeah. But, yeah. like, just little. I mean, to me, those aren't fights. I guess you consider those fights. I don't because me and Alexa have that, like, every day. I, I don't consider that I mean, fight. I don't really fight fight, though. Like, yeah. that was, like, y'all, a silly. Y'all no, but that's like, half what... joking. Me and Olivia's are a little bit more serious, but less frequent than yours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't ever really get mad. Like, we just, yeah. like, b- bicker a little back and forth, like, in a joking way. Yeah. But your guys' is more of, like, a serious I, note. I think I've decided I'm just going to let her say whatever she wants <laughs> and not argue with her from now on. Same. Because, <laughs> like, it's just not worth it. It's not worth yeah. it. Um, we had bad dates in New yes, York. traumatizing We dates. actually had a good one towards the end when we went to the pizza place. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was good. That was I a nice that. date. Yeah. Um, we're all invited to Miami. Oh, it's... I need to know details. It's with... It's... I already told you who we went to dinner with. The pizza? That like was sold. that was a nice date. Yeah, that was fun. The weekend prior, I got blown off. And I know a lot of people were roasting me for the last episode because I said I never get blown off. I was trying to be positive and manifest good things for myself because I already <laughs> knew that I was being blown off. Oh. But y'all wanted to take it as me being a cunt. But that's <clears throat> just not the case. I just like to manifest that I'm not going to be blown off. <laughs> Because I don't know why I would say that, you know? Oh, But, I mean, it sounds like you guys had an eventful trip. Oh, God, I just don't even remember anything. It's I mean, so neither. strange. It's, honestly, it's, it's, like, it's like we were... No, it's like a blur. Drugged. Yeah. Like, I don't remember yeah, anything. Yeah, honestly, I'm a little... Yeah, it just... I think we just were going through so much, like, stress, like, getting the dog and, like, traveling so much that we didn't really enjoy it as much. It was mainly, like, getting our apartment yeah, working. Chores. So it really wasn't... Yeah, chores. Yeah. I was literally so bored. I was putting myself to bed at 9 p.m. every night. Oh, so. God. I was reading books, watching Netflix, and working out, and that was legit all I did. All righty. So, since none of us are <laughs> as interesting as I planned for us to be, yes, <laughs> it's all boring. Um, <laughs> let's bop into today's episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Helix Sleep. Not only do we want to thank them for sponsoring today's episode, but also for the mattresses that they sent us. I don't know about yours, but my mattress is great and has helped me fall asleep so much quicker. So Helix is a premium mattress in a box company that makes mattresses to fit your preferences based on your sleeping style and your body type. Everybody's different and Helix knows that. 
So they made a sleep quiz that matches your unique body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. I love my Helix, and I think you would too. If you're looking for a new bed, make sure to check out Helix. Before getting my mattress, I did the Helix quiz, and I got paired with the Helix Moonlight mattress. And I have to say, it's been so good for my back and for the usual restless nights that I have. I just, me and my new puppy, we just lay on it and we zonk out together. I love my new mattress. So when I actually took the Helix sleep quiz, I got the Dusk mattress, which makes a lot of sense because as everyone knows, when I sleep, I cuddle Mr. Wolfie, my stuffed animal. So I lay on my back and that one is perfect for back sleepers. Yeah, and it does like body contour as well. Yeah. So I took the Helix quiz and I actually got matched with the Helix Sunset, which for me is perfect because I actually have back issues. So I'm also a side sleeper and it actually has really good support. So it's um, helping me with sleeping on the side and also preventing any more back issues that I have because I have been having a lot of back issues. So I'm really, really grateful for this mattress. So I've had my desk mattress for a few months and my number one thing that I love was delivered to my door because I'm kind of lazy. I don't want to go out and get it. But I also have realized I've been sleeping through the night. I don't wake up as often. And when I do wake up in the mornings, I don't feel so sore and stiff and uncomfortable. I'm like able to get up and go. So the best part of all of this is that Helix comes to your door for free and also it's rolled up. So it's very convenient. You know, I myself live in an apartment, uh, three stories. So I like that it was able to just come to my door and I was able to roll it up onto my bed. If it makes you nervous to buy something you haven't tried, Helix has a 100-night sleep trial, so you get more than three months to try the mattress to make sure that you love it. If you don't like your mattress, they actually come pick it up for you and you get a full refund. You can click the link below or go to helixsleep.com slash three girls and get up to $200 off your Helix mattress. Go to helixsleep.com slash three girls. I hope that all of you know by now that... I did porn. Wait, what? Olivia. <laughs> I was like, no way. <laughs> anyway. Okay, sorry. No I jokes. shot porn for eight months from 19 years old to on and off twice from 19 to 21. For a total of eight months, I shot four months and then I quit and then I shot another four months. So a total of eight months. Um, Today's episode is going to be discussing my experience as well as just a general consensus and stuff that you guys were able to find through research and knowing me and knowing um, other people who have worked in the sex yeah. industry. And just like the stigmatism that comes with it. And, yeah. You know. <clears throat> um, but I mean, to me, what's crazy that I had found was that a lot of women that went into the porn industry, and this is obviously like a very sensitive topic, you know, mm-hmm. but a lot of them had said that 70% of women that went into prostitution or the porn industry um, had some sort of physical uh, abuse as a mm-hmm. child. Yeah. And um, that's why they resorted to that. And because they had no other uh, sources of income or weren't able to get a job and they felt like that was their only way to make an income. Mm-hmm. So to me, that really, you know, like hurt and like hurt me inside to know that because I obviously like struggle and I've had those Um, I've had those thoughts growing up. You know, I went through physical abuse as a child. I Mm -hmm. was raped. So I definitely have had those triggers of thinking like, oh, maybe this is my only way to make money. And maybe I should Mm -hmm. try this out. Maybe I should try escorting. Maybe I should try, you know, um, seeking arrangements. And I've had those temptations. But I think that sometimes growing up in a proper environment helps you to get out of that. So if you Mm -hmm. don't even have a proper environment, that's even scary because then you have no one to give you guidance, you know, to do so. I even had just here in LA, um, when I was like 21 ish, uh, I just was meeting with people for like job interviews or whatever. And I've had guys try to take advantage. And I've actually had someone tell me that like, you won't get anywhere in, in, in Hollywood or in LA without sleeping with people. I've had mm-hmm. like high up business, like men, you know, company owners say that. And they tell girls that luckily, like I went home to my boyfriend and I was like, um, listen to what this guy just said obviously wasn't down but a lot of girls actually believe that they won't be somebody or won't be able to be successful without sleeping with people and doing these certain things because guys or even girls whoever of people of power manipulate and Mm -hmm. tell people like you have to do this that's it's great that you had someone to go back to to help Mm -hmm. give you that reassurance that the decision that you made was right Mm -hmm. um that's kind of 
the drawback to being young and naive is that, like Olivia mentioned, a lot of these girls who are getting into the sex industry, whether it be porn or prostitution <clears throat> or even just, you know, posting nudes online and doing OnlyFans, is that, like she mentioned, they come from homes that are not necessarily broken, but just don't have guidance or there's abuse going on or there's chaos inside of the home. I know for me, a lot of people always ask me, oh, you did porn. Um, you must have been raped growing up or you must have had sexual abuse. It wasn't like that at all for me personally. I don't know if this is what caused it, but I've shared this before on the podcast that growing up, my parents were divorced. My sister has severe schizophrenia. And I think where I first started ideal idealizing porn stars and um, girls like Anna Nicole Smith and Playboy was when my sister was going through her schizophrenic episodes, there was her cutting herself in front of me. Um, One time I came home from school and she had hung herself and I had to cut her down from our swing set when I was in elementary school. And I remember going through those experiences and one time I found online the girls next door of Playboy and I just was like, wow, their life looks so amazing. Mm -hmm. And you can just hit up like this old man and he'll fly you out to LA. I could get away from all of this and my life would be so incredible. Like theirs, they have all this cute clothes. They're beautiful. Um, And so I remember just wanting to escape from the situation that I had going on at home and I would just hide in a closet or in my room and and watch that and just fantasize about being 18 and going and doing that. But the danger in it is of the sex industry and porn being glamorized is that young girls like me are going to see all the positives and they're mm-hmm. not going to see the negatives. Mm-hmm. And this is where it really shows how naive I was because when I first got into porn, I had no idea that I was going to have to suck dick or have sex, which sounds so weird because you know that you're going to suck dick or have sex, but it didn't register. It didn't process. I really didn't think about the acts that I was going to have to do Mm -hmm. to become a porn star. Consequences either because you just thought of the glamour of it. Like you said, yeah, it was all glamorized in my head. It was all oh, I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that. But it was never, I have to do this to Mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. And I think it's hard for the young mind to see that. And then there's also the issue of being young and naive and not knowing how to say no in certain situations. And luckily you, Mm -hmm. speaking back on your experiences, you clearly had were raised right or you know had the confidence to say no and you had someone to go back on to help reassure you that you made the right decisions. Yeah, because as long, like, as well as you, I grew up watching Girls Next Door. I mm-hmm. love Playboy. <laughs> Growing up my whole life, I was like, I want to be a Playboy model. I want to do this. I was obsessed with it, just like you. Yeah. I was in Indiana and sitting there, bored, nothing going on, and I would watch these hot girls on TV, like the blonde, beautiful, the mansion, yeah. a pool, party, yeah. whatever they wanted. Yeah. And I was so obsessed. That's all I said to everyone every day. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be in Playboy. But the older that I got, and my dad actually lived in Vegas, and we would travel out here, and I would just get, I got more um, experience, like, in their life and in their world, and I got to see how it was. Yeah. So, luckily for me, I did get to see kind of, like, both sides in a way that that kept me from, before I turned 18, I was like, I actually don't want to do this anymore. Yeah. And what deterred you from those situations where you wanted to get a modeling job, and it was told to you oh if you sleep with someone or you do this sexual act you'll be more likely to obtain it what deterred you from giving into those situations I don't know if it was one specific thing I think I just knew it was wrong because my mom always would tell me like your body is for you like don't let someone try to convince you that you have to do specific things unless Mm -hmm. it's what you want to do if someone has to tell you, oh, you have to sleep with me if you want this, my mom would always, you know, remind me that I do not have to do those things. Yeah. So that's kind of it. And obviously my dad was the same. Boat. Did your dad ever, I mean, sorry, did your mom ever have any background in like the sex industry because or anything like that or like experience? Because it seems, you know, like she must have had some sort of experience going through something growing up that she would Thinking instill that, that, my instill that in yeah. you as like a young girl. Um, I mean, she obviously hasn't opened up to me fully like that, but I yeah. do know um, 
she did do modeling at a young age mm-hmm. and so then she kind of had those pressures that you were speaking of moved to Vegas in California and lived in Hollywood with my dad he was a professional boxer and when they were together he it was like the highlight of his career he was world champion mm-hmm. and so she was around these celebrities and around that lifestyle so luckily she was married and had my dad but I think she got to see how women were treated and how girls were treated yeah. and wanted to keep me away from it yeah so I th- I think that would probably be why I mean, interesting uh, statistic that Alexa shared with me this morning. Do you want to tell them? Because I know you did the research, so I don't want to take (laughs) your... No, so I was researching um, because someone actually brought to my attention that a lot of porn stars die from, like, drug overdose, Mm -hmm. accidental or on purpose, suicide, whatnot. So I'm like, I wonder what the average, like, life expectancy... What is it? Yeah, it's like life expectancy expectancy of a porn star is... And it's actually 37 years old, and that's, like, on average, obviously. A lot of them, if you look, die in their early 20s. Yeah. And then a normal person would live to be about 78 years old. So that just gives you an idea. It's like a 40-year gap. you have to think, why is the average life of someone who was in the sex industry or shot pornography 37 versus, what did you say, 78? Yeah. Like, that's insane. That's a huge jump. What do you think causes that? I definitely think a lot of these deaths are probably drug related, like you yes. mentioned, or suicide. Um, I think even like sex trafficking, like I think that's an issue. Um, I mean, with yeah, with any yeah, with well. any countries that hatch or any country that's legalized prostitution, uh, the sex trafficking rates are way higher. Which is, I mean, I feel like that's common sense, but it's also very sad, you know. And I think just aggression, abuse that comes with being in the porn industry that women go through, it's a lot of trauma for them. So as you had mentioned, I think turning to drug use and overdosing, you know, feeling extremely depressed and not wanting to continue like the life because you just don't know how to get out of it. And I think that's also very scary. And I'm sure you probably have been in those situations with a manager that you've had or an agent Mm -hmm. where you felt trapped and you couldn't get out of doing something you'd no longer want to do because you're like, you're finally capable enough of knowing that I don't like what I'm doing to my body or I don't Mm -hmm. feel stable mentally, you know, physically, like this is not glamour. Like I want to do something else and you don't know how to escape. So a lot of girls fear that. So, well, that's, that's, you know, why I wanted to do this podcast today and why I try to share my experiences, even though it's extremely difficult for me, because I do have girls who are still in the industry, reach out and say, wow, you're an inspiration to me. Um, You know, you are right where I am now. You're you don't have to do any of this to make money anymore. You support yourself like you're doing great. So I think it's important for us to share this story to help, like you said, people who are still suffering and also to help deter girls who are thinking about possibly putting themselves in that situation. Mm -hmm. One of the downfalls of the industry, as you mentioned, is agents, um, your manager. I've had quite a few bad experiences with agents and managers just... They're supposed to work for you and they tell you that they work for you. But a lot of the pressures in the industry and the manipulation comes directly from the agents. I remember being flown out to L.A. for the first time. And as soon as I came, it was almost like instant. Now that I'm thinking about it with a mature mind and being an adult woman, I feel like I was being groomed from the minute that I landed Mm -hmm. in L.A. I they ask you before you join the industry. What are you comfortable doing? And you check off a little list for your agent. Like, are you comfortable with blowjobs? Are you comfortable with boy girl? Do you just mm-hmm. want to do girl girl? Do you, will you do DPs? Will you do gang bangs? Um, and so I remember only marking off the first time I only marked off that I wanted to do girl girl. The initial agent who I signed with wouldn't sign me if I was only doing girl girl. So I was basically mm-hmm. forced <clears throat> to do boy girl. Yeah. I never checked off the boxes for doing DPs, gangbangs, any of that like drastic stuff. And I told my first agent, I will never do a gangbang. I will never do anal. I will never do any of that. And somehow, lo and behold, I end up doing all of it because from the minute that I stepped off that plane, and started talking to this man, he would say things like, oh, all the good sluts um, do gangbangs for cheap. The good sluts get fucked for $500. And they would really glamorize doing more for less money because that's what worked for them. So basically in the porn industry, the agents don't 
care about the girls to a certain extent. They only care about pleasing the producers and the film companies because then the film companies hire the girls from that specific agent more than the other ones. And that's what they care about is having a good relationship with the production companies, the producers. So if the agent can get you to work for extremely cheap and do extreme acts, they're going to push you to do that. And these are 40, 50, 60 year old Mm -hmm. men who have been working in this industry for 20 to 30 years. They know how to manipulate and twist up Mm -hmm. a young 18, 19, 20 year old girl's mind to get her to do these things. And I've often said that the agents need to be completely eliminated if that industry is going to exist because that's Mm -hmm. where I feel that I was pressured Mm -hmm. and put into situations that I didn't want to be in. I also have to say and just take full responsibility here. I technically, in the situations that I'll talk about later in this episode, I never claim rape. I never claim any of that because I technically never said no. Being young me, I felt like I wanted to please everyone. I felt like I wanted to make my agent happy. They told me I was going to be so good. I was going to be so great. I wanted to make the producers happy. I wanted to make the fans happy. I could be dying inside doing something, but I would have a smile on my face and say, thank you for the work, everyone. Like, Mm -hmm. I never said no. So no one is to blame for my experiences. I can't say that. And I'm not saying that. I never said no. So. I mean, there's also another thing, too, is there are girls out there that want to do these things. So like Mm -hmm. how you were okay with just say you want to do girl and girl. Mm -hmm. They should have allowed that or you should have been allowed to just do girl and girl and not felt pressured or pushed because. There's girls out there that like to do gangbangs. They want to Mm -hmm. do those things. So why do they have to manipulate and take a girl and make her feel like she has to do things that she doesn't want to do? Mm -hmm. So like you said, um, maybe get rid of agents or get rid of whoever and let the girls decide on their own what they want to do because there will be girls that like to do these things. You know, not everyone would be miserable doing it. Does that make sense? Like. Let yeah. them decide and choose. And I think I think that's just the whole thing is like the dark side of pornography is that it isn't glamour, that mm-hmm. it's, you know, it has the wrong people working for the industry because they, like she had mentioned, like they don't care about their clients or like their, you know, their models. They only care about like what's their, their, relationship, their income and their yeah. relationship. Yeah. So, you know, pornography can shift sexual interests, relationships and behaviors. And that's really scary because aggression is a huge thing in pornography. And, you know, I, I support anyone that's a sex worker. I have nothing against them, Mm -hmm. but I don't like, I'm very strongly against it because I believe that people that work for the industry should be, you know, they should just be like, um, like what's the term that I'm looking for? Um, they should pick out more proper people to work for it. If that makes sense. Like someone who's really going to, going to take care of someone because it is a very serious industry. It can really mess you up mentally, physically. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I know we're going to discuss ethical porn. I think that's something that's really important and that they're trying to instill in schools for younger boys because, you know, males do show more aggression, um, towards females. And there was a study that was done saying that 88% of scenes did show more aggression by yeah. the male, um, like throughout the porn uh, stores, the videos that they release, which is insane, yeah. you know? But even right now, sorry, it's like a thing on TikTok. <clears throat> if you see like gr- being strangled, but to an extent, like whenever yeah. girls are posting like, oh, I love to be choked. I love to be strangled. Like we like it in a playful manner. Like yeah. you can do these things and it not be aggress- like mm-hmm. aggressive and, you know, we're passing out. Yeah. But so there's, there's a way to do like, you know, certain there's, things and not. Yeah, there's, um, when it comes to that, So what I was talking about, like being pressured um, to do like more and more things, more hardcore things. So there's two different main genres of porn. There's gonzo porn, which is the aggressive porn that you guys are talking about. It's Hmm. the rough anal sex. It's the choking. It's and I'll go more into that. And then there's um, vanilla porn, which is what Olivia is talking about as um, ethical porn is what I think you would consider. Um, It's just like classic, like missionary, like just like basically like artsy sex. I was going to say, wait, I'm kind of laughing the inside because I've had someone call me vanilla before. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I love vanilla. I'm like, why are you I so like vanilla? vanilla? I'm like, what do you mean? It makes me kind of hungry, but I'm, I like, I would, I've never even heard of the term gonzo to be honest. Yeah. 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 So wow. gonzo is <clears throat> the, the first level of it, I would say would be just, it's just like, there's no like 
artistic vision to it. It's just yeah. like rough, hardcore sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and that could be vaginal penetration. The next level up would be anal penetration in a gonzo style. Um, and then there's a level far more than that. And I would say that during my time in porn, I'm not sure what is like the hype right now in porn. It goes through like different phases, Mm -hmm. but during my short stint in porn, um, they're really extreme acts were what was popular. And that's why being the number one performer in the industry at the time, everyone wanted to make money off me. So they pushed me to do these things. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just gets really extreme, like you were saying, abusive. Um, did you ever feel like, did you ever go through those experiences where you had to do a scene where it was very aggressive and you f- just felt like. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to go into too much detail. Like, honestly, some of my experiences are really humiliating for me. And I wish that they never happened. There's stuff going on, like people getting pissed on, men are pissing inside of women's vaginas, assholes, down their throats. They're sorry. Oh, <laughs> don't cry. <laughs> Now I'm crying. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> no, don't cry. I'm just okay. giving some examples. But... No, that's honestly, that's really hard. And I think like I had mentioned earlier, it's just so important for young men to stop viewing, stop viewing women as sex objects, because I believe that, you know, instilling that curriculum in school at a younger age. And they had actually said there's a fact that says that the more a young person had learned about the use of pornography from their school education or sex education is less likely to see women as sex objects. And I feel that's why, you know, I I feel so passionate about the porn industry because I don't believe that they should be showing those types of scenes because it does view women as just an object and it's not okay to do that. Like, I enjoy watching porn. Like, girl, like I, you know, but like, I want to watch ethical porn. I want it to be normalized and I want it to be taught to where it shouldn't be to where a woman is being abused and yeah. is, you know, like the, the male is showing aggression because that actually is going to translate into his relationships with women in the future his wife like Mm -hmm. it's actually statistically proven that it's going to show aggression in a marriage in a relationship and that's i mean how is that healthy like that's not healthy at all well a lot of it is like young boys don't understand and they think that this is normal and that's what girls want so they've probably never been with a girl before and they see these horrible things and they're like oh this is how to please a girl this is what i have to do this is what she wants and then they you know do these things and they act certain ways and they don't realize the effects that they're having on women Yeah, well, they do say that serial killer and rapists are the ones who are consuming these extreme Mm -hmm. types of porns. A lot of um, serial killers, when they've gone through their search history, they're watching like these abusive porn and there's tons of Mm -hmm. pornography on their search history. I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I obviously, like I said, I've watched porn. I do. Yeah, I mean, I've stumbled (laughs) wrong with watching. Yeah, but I've stumbled upon some videos where I'm not gonna lie. I really questioned why is this even allowed on Mm -hmm. the Internet? Like I felt very like I was just turned off. I was like shut my laptop like I can't even look at this I was like I cannot believe that this is okay like this is not okay to treat women like this yeah well I I know that I got emotional but I do want to continue giving examples Mm -hmm. of some of those things just so people know um what are but what were some of the things that you saw that you were like wow this is really crazy yeah I mean there was one scene where I had seen um obviously the the male was having sex with a girl and um she was literally crying because he was being so aggressive. Like, I guess, you know, he was just too big for her. I mean, mm-hmm. she was like full blown crying mm-hmm. and he was like slapping her like you like that. Like, you know, I was just yeah. like, oh, my God, how can this tur-? like I could not get off to this. So I don't know who watches this to some people have that fetish and it's crazy. Yeah, and that's, that's why they put it out there because they're like, oh, somebody will watch it, which is just like, yeah, no offense. But like, that's disgusting because obviously she's not OK. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, to me, it's just it really makes me sad because I think of the girl and I think, wow, like I can just see it in her eyes that she did not want to do this scene, but she's doing it because of the reasons of, you know, she needs the money or this is a flexible yeah. job for her right now. She was convinced she was pressured. You know, she was manipulated into doing this by her agent because he, you know, told her, like, it's either this way or the highway. Like, I can't even imagine how that girl felt having to do something that she clearly does not want to do like there this is not acting like she's full-blown crying Mm -hmm. you know like i there's just no way she's acting and enjoying this so yeah no i've had friends who have been choked out so much that they've actually passed out during a scene um 
there's really just like crazy stuff going on that damages people's bodies for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. I luckily don't have any issues, but I've seen scenes shot in Europe where guys are literally punching into a girl's asshole like this i'm like she's going to have issues for the rest of her yeah, life yeah. due to this and is it worth someone making a little bit of money and someone jerking off to it mm -hmm. um the, one of the worst honestly i feel like i'm in denial sometimes and i can't accept some of the things that i've done there is one thing that you know I tried talking to a therapist about before something that I had to do for a scene that was really rough for me. Um, basically, this guy had a bowl and he like gagged me until I threw up into it. And then he like pissed in the bowl. And during the scene, he asked me to drink it. And I didn't know how to say no. It was one of the most disgusting, foul scenes I ever had to do. And... I'm telling a therapist this and they don't even fucking know what to say to me. Yeah. yeah. No one can relate. Like no one fucking knows what to say about it. And so when it obviously, so obviously I don't know how like porn is shot. They don't tell you beforehand. Does this, did they tell this guy to, to do these things or did he just my in agent, his own brain? This one, my decide? agent was actually very pissed about. Okay. And again, like, I'm not saying that I was raped. Mm. I But you were put in the spot. You were I put, yeah, told this guy, like, yeah, I'm excited. Let's do this. I just, I didn't know how to say no. I, yeah. I didn't, I just wanted everyone to be happy. So it's, I can't blame anyone. All that I can do now is make the best of yeah. my experiences yeah. and accept it, which is really hard for me to do. Um, Sorry, what was your question again? Um, I mean, no, like, I think you pretty much answered my question. <laughs> But no, I was just gonna, you know, um, chime in and say about how you had to do something that, you know, you didn't want to do or you felt pressured. I definitely can relate to that just even by like working at Hooters. I know I mean you have worked there. I obviously have a little longer history of that. And, you know, I definitely was a sex object. Like that's who I was viewed as working mm -hmm. at Hooters. Clearly, I was the complete opposite of that. But, you know, I definitely was pressured into some things that I didn't want to do with men. Um, they had the audacity to ask me to literally go give them a hand job behind the dumpsters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, I'm sorry, that's, it's not funny, but no, it's, it's, like, it's like comical. It's but comical. It's behind a dumpster. No, I was really <laughs> thinking, first off, why not at least the car? Yes. <laughs> like a dumpster. Second off, can you imagine you're at a restaurant and you have the audacity <laughs> to look at your Sweetie waiter? Girl, wait, wait, what do you mean? After, after, I I after I finish my chicken tenders, can you go jerk me off behind this dumpster? Yeah, oh my you know, God. But they would they would push my limits. Like they would just kind of like joke around at first or like, oh, we, um, and they I'll give are you a hundred. They're quite touchy sometimes too, no? Yeah. And you know, Know, they were like oh i'll give you a hundred dollars if you take off your panties for me and you know i was vulnerable i was young i was like oh like no harm like okay like he just wants my panties like heck yeah a hundred dollars like but that's then gonna they're gonna keep, they're gonna be like how yeah, much, they kept pushing and they put me up and once they like put you on the spot like it's so hard to like say no and you feel so awkward because you don't want to want ruin a relationship with a client who yeah. comes into hooters every single day okay. who is basically paying your bills mm -hmm. who's tipping you you know too you don't want to piss them off to where they're gonna go say something so you know i I definitely can relate on the pressure thing and I can I can definitely understand how you felt like being put in a situation that you did not know you're going to be put in because it mm -hmm. is so hard to get out of that. So, you know, like I definitely understand sex workers and the porn industry a lot more just because I've had personal experiences that I can relate to. Yeah, I think I've talked to you about this briefly and I don't know her full story because obviously I haven't got to talk to her, but I told you I had a cousin that actually I found out oh, did yeah. porn. And her and I were super close growing up, and she was kind of like my half-cousin. So anyway, her dad lived in a different state. We kind of grew apart for a few years, but when I moved out here, we kind of rekindled. And she was obviously a lot different than I had remembered, and I kind of – I remember my um, dad's friend being like, oh, she definitely – like, she's a sex worker. I'm like, no, 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 no. Yeah. I end up finding out that she is, but um, now I've even shown you before and after pictures. Like, she's – back home very unwell and unstable like had a really bad drug problem mm -hmm. she now hears like voices in her head like she was going through a lot of like obviously abuse and issues and before that like she was a very normal girl especially from what mm -hmm. i remember i looked up to her she's my older cousin and she looks completely different i remember i was like showing you these things mm -hmm. and it's so crazy that like i got to like witness firsthand that it turned like a normal, like my normal cousin into like now she is like in a mental asylum. 
Yeah, and so I would say that's definitely attributed, one, to probably the experience of shooting porn. And I'm not saying every scene and every shoot that I did was horrible. I'm saying that the handful that were traumatic for me were enough mm-hmm. to do damage. It just there takes were one. probably yeah. three to five that were really traumatic for me, whether it was being sent to a set with someone who was way too old and I didn't even know who I was going to fuck and I was disgusted the whole time because they were 80 years old or you know one of the experiences that I just listed or just being pressured into doing something that I was scared of doing because it was too extreme um that can definitely be very dramatic and I would say is the number one contributor to why I left the industry and disown it basically because of those Mm -hmm. horrible experiences that I had um, the other downside to having done porn, obviously, is the stigma, and that's probably the thing that's hardest for me to live with now is the stigma of having done porn and knowing that I can run, but I can't hide from it. No matter mm-hmm. where I go, everyone knows, everyone's seen me get fucked. I just have to do the best that I can with it, and um, it's... It's like having, I feel like I have a life sentence over my head at 24. Like, I'm always going to be Lana Rhodes. I'm always going to be a porn star, no matter how bad I don't want to be. And I've shared some of, like, the issues that I've had. Like, you even met my neighbor. You didn't meet her, but you saw my neighbor in Chicago. When I had a house in Chicago, I was married. I was planning on having kids with my ex-husband. She would harass me because she knew who I was. She would call the police on me, say I was yeah. shooting porn I mean, at you my had, house. I was going to say, didn't you have um, even that this house? They had asked, like, what you were going to do here, which I thought was really um, disrespectful. And I was just like, yeah, why? Like, why? I mean, I can understand why they would ask. However, every time that it's bought up and I'm just like, I'm me. I'm a Mara Maple yeah. right now. It's extremely, like hard for me I'm like why do I have to be reminded of this Mm -hmm. all of the time even we Olivia went on a date the other day and I went with her and her date and his friend were asking me porn question and it's just like yeah I mean come to find out they were just disgusting males and had a fetish for porn and yeah but even you're obviously pissed because you're like oh he was supposed to be my date but I'm literally wanting to kill myself because I don't want to be fucking reminded of this shit. Yeah. I don't want to be thought of that way. Yeah. Um, and I would say, you know, I definitely um, deal with depression and suicidal thoughts monthly because of my past in porn. Um, and that's just me being really candid. You know, it's, yeah. it's not fun. It's not... Um, a great thing to have over your head. Yeah. But I mean, I know like you said that it's something that you have to live with for the rest of your life. But the thing is, so like th- the direction that you're going is so inspiring to many. And it's so important because you you just did a complete 180. Like you have so much class, like, you know, you are intellectual, like you are self-educating yourself, like you're doing all the things that a lot of, you know, porn stars or um, girls that are still in the industry can't even do at all because they yeah. don't have that proper knowledge or they don't have that the guidance they don't have the friends to like yeah. show them and lead them the way and say hey like this is what you shouldn't do this is what you should mm-hmm. do because you don't have that guidance when you're in that industry like you're completely mind fucked so the direction that i think you're going is amazing and it's super inspiring like i said and trust me like you will be known as Amara Maple, not Lana Rhodes, in 10 years. And I can promise you if you just keep going in the direction that you are because you're doing really good for yourself. Yeah. And you're, like, showing all these young girls. Like, first off, you're giving them examples. The girls that are going to watch us that have maybe had the thoughts or been in your shoes, they're now going to get to see that it is not glamorous and that maybe they should not. And you're also helping the girls that are in that right now that are currently doing these things that there is a way out and that they don't have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I I hope that um, my experience and my suffering through this experience will help other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whether it's helping someone make better decisions than I made or it's helping people who are in the thick of it get out of it. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to wrap up this episode. I don't feel like I got to touch on everything that I wanted, but I hope that it um, somehow help someone in some way so crazy but the other night when we got back from new york i hadn't had a vibrator with me for the whole entire trip <laughs> Jesus Christ. so yeah. i was going off with my hitachi and it actually broke because i used it so much 
thank God this episode is sponsored by Adam and Eve, so I can use our discount code and order a new one. Free stuff is awesome, but free stuff to spice up your bedroom is even better. Select almost any one item for 50% off and Adam and Eve loads on free stuff. So you know how I love lingerie. I like to take my little sexy pics. Um, I actually just ordered so much from Adam and Eve and I'm super excited for it to come in. I've ordered from them before and I put them on even when I wasn't really feeling myself and I felt hot as fuck. So damn, I need to check them out now. I know, I'm excited. (laughs) Use our offer code 3G1K at checkout on adamandeve.com. That's 3G1K at checkout on adamandeve.com. That's 3G1K at checkout at adamandeve.com. 50% off, free gifts, and free shipping. What's not to love? After years of fine print contracts and being ripped off by large wireless providers, I've learned that there's always a catch. So when I first heard that Mint Mobile offers a wireless plan starting at just $15 a month, I was like, what's the catch? But after speaking with them and using their services, I realized that it all made sense. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they're the first company to sell wireless service online only. By cutting out retail stores, there's no mystery fees that get passed down to you. Instead, Mint just passes on sweet savings directly to you. Yeah, so for people (laughs) um, looking to save some extra bucks, Mint Mobile does offer premium wireless for only $15 a month, guys. All plans come with unlimited talk and text, plus high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. And if you're not 100% satisfied, guys, Mint Mobile does have you covered with their seven-day money bag guaranteed. And you get to keep your same phone number along with all of your existing contacts. Oh, that's actually pretty awesome because that's important to me. I need my phone number. Me too. I've had the same phone number since I was 10 years old. Same. (laughs) Legit. So you guys should switch to Mint Mobile because they do have the premium wireless for only $15 a month. So to get your new wireless plan just for $15 a month and get it shipped to your door for free, go to mintmobile.com slash 3G1K. That's mintmobile.com slash 3G1K. Yeah. Um, so let's dive into the fan questions. So my fan question is, how do I go up to a random girl in public and start a conversation asking for a friend? Um, so I'm going to say this for girls and guys. So for me, I've learned to maybe pick something out from a person. For instance, I've been in a situation where I was sitting across with a bunch of friends and I had found someone like really attractive that I wanted to like Hmm. say something to them, you know? (laughs) So how I went about it is I looked at his shoes and I was like, oh my gosh, I love his shoes. Like I, I'm a, I'm a huge shoe girl. Like you guys know. And I made a compliment uh, to his shoes and I said, hey, oh my gosh, Nikes, (laughs) of course. (laughs) Um, But they're like the special edition. Okay. Um, So, yeah. So, you know, I pointed out his shoes and I said, oh, my God, are those like so-and-so, like, you know, the certain type? And he was just like, oh, my gosh, like, how did you know? So that's how I striked that conversation. And then we started talking. So sometimes you just have to look at the other person and pick something out. Or sometimes, like, even just making a funny joke if you're in in a weird situation or, like, the location that you're at. So obviously don't be creepy. Like, don't try to force a conversation that should not be there. Um, because then that person's not going to want to talk to you. Yeah. But like I said, if you want to just strike a conversation, look for something that's on them, compliment them if you like something about them. And usually it'll get that person to respond and then you guys can start a conversation. I agree. Definitely um, compliment is an easy thing. Um, also be like, oh, I like your sweater. Where'd you get that from? Start a conversation. Another thing I like to do is maybe ask a question of some sort, you know, not like play dumb, but I don't know how to say it. Um, say, no, no, you're say you're somewhere and you're like, oh, actually, do you know of a good place to get pizza? Like, I'm not from around here. Like, something yeah. random, like, yeah. whatever. That's, that's, I've heard of that. Like, acting like dumb, but obviously you're not. Yeah, like, just, just, like, just to get their advice on mm-hmm. something, and it strikes a conversation, and, you know, if they're into you, maybe they'll take you. Ooh. I hate when I actually have a question, though, and then they think that I just want to talk to them. <laughs> that honestly happens to me more often than me actually wanting to hit on Well, someone. that's when you ask a girl. Oh, right. Yeah. Well, what if there's no girl? But then they also might think (laughs) you really are bad. Like you honestly, like you ask people questions and then you just keep going and they won't like shut the fuck up. And I'm just like, oh, God, she just started. this. I feel bad (laughs) stopping the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, all right. So nice. (laughs) Um, I really can't give advice on this. I've only asked one. Well, besides like Instagram DMs, that's completely easier, though. In real life, I've only had to ask one guy out in my entire life. Um, It was a guy at the gym, and 
I probably followed him around the gym for two, three hours trying to work up the confidence. Eventually I waited on the couches like downstairs after waiting like three hours for him. And he waved to me and then I just got up and started walking with him and like was talking <laughs> You're like, him. all right, here we go, he, buddy. He was in Where are we going? <laughs> yeah, he he does H back and so I was like, mm. My furnace is broken. Do you think you could come fix it? And he's like, Really? And I'm like, No, it's not really broken. Oh, like, you okay, go home so really quick to like, break the, it. Yeah, you like, play uh, dumb question. I'm like, like Can oh. I get your number like oh. to come fix it? Um and he was like, Wait, is it really broken? I'm like, Yes, no. <laughs> yeah, like, it can be. <laughs> it can be, it I'll out. break it myself. <laughs> and now asking a question and then obviously a compliment everyone loves a compliment mm-hmm. so those are easy go-tos my question advice when someone you had a good relationship and bond with but they end up ghosting i actually had this happen to me recently um i thought that i had like the best what was it like second hangout date with someone like i thought the chemistry was amazing insane Um, This person followed up with me after the date like a few times, but never asked me to hang out again. And to me, that was just shocking because I thought that we just had the best time Mm -hmm. together, but clearly they didn't feel the same way or they would have asked me out again, right? Um, But my advice for this is giving myself and you advice because I just went through a similar thing is if they wanted to, they They would. would. Okay, TikTok. Dude, she but literally have, came into my room. I have room. something crazy to yeah, tell you. Yeah, she came into my room at like four in the morning with flowers and coffee. And she goes, Olivia, if he wanted to, he would. And I'm like, oh my God, what? Did you just find the love of your life? Like, why are you holding roses and a book? Like, what's going on? Like, where did you also, go for like three hours? <laughs> so <laughs> my ex was in New York at the same time as me. Why did I just say New York like that? Mm-hmm. Um, but, <laughs> and I wasn't going to hang out with him, but then I couldn't sleep. So I was like, fuck it. I'll just bring my dog over to his house at like 2 a.m. Um, for him to meet my dog, like as friends on some friendship shit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was Easter. So I was like, why not? Um, so I went over there. We like hung out for a little bit. Um, again, I just feel like I have to reiterate, didn't hook up, like just some real friendship type shit. I leave at what, like 4 a.m.? And it said that Starbucks was going to be open. So I Ubered to Starbucks. Well, actually, I dropped off my dog. And then I Ubered to Starbucks. Because it was Easter, they were closed till 5 a.m. So there's a little subway underpass next to the Starbucks. I'm sitting there. um, People are coming up, down. I'm sitting there for like 30 minutes. And I have another 30 minutes to go. Um, There is a man of the streets. And by that, I mean like a homeless man who I think was also maybe on meth, crack, you know, whatever his drug of preference was because the way that he was walking, he was like, you know. I mean, he was tired. He had a bouquet of flowers, though. And so, you know, he's coming up the stairs all slowly like this, and I'm like, should I stay here? Should I have a conversation with him? I'm like, you know what? Why not? Let me have a conversation with this man. I'm going to be here for 30 minutes. I should brighten his day. I'm sure a lot of people don't want to talk to him because he can be intimidating. Yeah. You know, especially being a girl alone there, it can be scary to talk to a homeless man who seems like he's on drugs. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking talk to this man. I'm going to try to give him the best day of his life by making him feel important. So he comes up to me. Of course, he starts talking to me once he makes it to the top of the stairs. And, um, you know, he's on drugs. So he's just like, you know, just talking about crazy shit, like crazy shit. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know. And I'm like, you know, you can be anything that you want in life. Just hyping this man up, trying to give him some good old life advice. Um, And he's just talking crazy. But eventually he's like, you like really like made my day like you made me feel really special I don't know why I got these flowers today but I think that they're for you and so Mm -hmm. he gives me these flowers and I'm like you know what Starbucks is open now why don't you come in with me and I'll buy us both a coffee so I go into Starbucks I get us both caramel macchiato (laughs) um we go out I'm like listen I have a flight this morning I hope you have a wonderful day like stay blessed and I somehow in passing mentioned to him that I love to read now this man has three bags of stuff and that's all his possessions he doesn't own anything Mm -hmm. so two of the few things that he owned were flowers and then he also had a barack obama book and when i mentioned to him that i like to read he gave me one of his only possessions which was his barack obama book and he had already given me the flowers this man barely owns anything and he gave me his only book his only form of entertainment and flowers and i'm just like this man who literally has nothing gave me everything. Yeah. 
if a fucking man wants to, he fucking will. Yeah. And, and he so, was like, he probably stole the flowers from Yeah, someone. like, honestly, he probably did steal yeah. the flowers or found them in a garbage can or something. But I'll tell you, I, I bought that book home with me because that book means so much because mm-hmm. this man gave me, he doesn't have anything and he gave me everything that he had. Mm-hmm. And so I broke into the house at like 4, <laughs> 5 a.m. And I'm like, Olivia, if he wanted to, he would. I'm like, yelling. look, this man doesn't have anything. And he gave me everything that he has. Yeah. I mean, I forgot what the question was. Wait, what was the question? Oh, again? it was, um, <laughs> it was, um, so you felt, basically ghosting. you felt like you had a connection um, or the relationship and bond and they end up ghosting. So the I moral mean, of the yeah. story is if they wanted to, to be with you they wanted to yeah. talk to you they wanted to see with you they would if they yeah if they felt the same connection or if they yeah, felt the thing, let yeah. it, so let don't it yeah let it go let it don't go. dwell on it don't sit there i mean we've all been there i've definitely yeah. had yeah. guys i've talked to for like a month and we've talked about like being serious and all mm-hmm. of a sudden boom nothing yeah me <laughs> so it happens to everyone and the the worst thing that you can do is sit there and dwell and be like why not why me why didn't they pick me yeah, then or, they're, they're no not the right get person. over it and move think on of scenarios like oh maybe because this i'm definitely guilty of is not accepting that they didn't want me mm-hmm. and thinking like oh maybe they're just shy maybe Making they maybe they just them. love me too much they're scared I'm like <laughs> i'm the opposite i'm like all right well i wasn't the one for them we know i'm very like um to wear you're masculine, you're realistic. No, no, I no, I was also gonna say I feel like everything happens for a reason. And everyone is put in your life for a reason and also taken out for a reason. Mm-hmm. So if someone ghosts me or disappears from my life, I'm like that was probably for the best because if they yeah. had stayed, they probably would have made me more sad mm-hmm. or brought like more you Hard know toxic you. negative. Yeah, yeah. yeah. could have kept you from doing something. So yeah. So everything. if someone leaves your life, all right, cool, let them. Yeah. Yeah. It's very, it's a very simple saying, but I think I had spoken about this um, a while back on the podcast is that I had to realize that everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. And, you know, if someone isn't meant to be with you there, it's for a reason. Like you said, it's yeah. stopping you from possibly maybe getting a, a future career, you know, uh, a, like a gig of your, like a dream gig or traveling or yeah. becoming friends with someone else or honestly meeting your husband the next day, like your future, the love of your life. It's Yeah, you it's, know, what, you know what they say, don't let your boyfriend stop you from meeting your, your husband. husband. <laughs> oh, I like that. Yeah, if someone goes to you, all right, yeah. bye. Mine is, how do you get back into dating and actually give guys a chance? I'm currently... It's been, like, two months since I've even, like, done anything at all. I don't talk to you guys, whatever. So I guess this would be good for me because I haven't gotten back into dating. But I feel like when I'm ready, I will know my mistakes in the past is I would always have to have a guy to be texting or have someone to hang out with or just Mm -hmm. whatever. And that was very mm, toxic for me. What I'm doing right now is I don't talk to really anyone. And I think that when you are ready and you focus on yourself, like we always say, and you're happy with yourself and your friends, you'll know when you're ready to get back yeah. into dating. When someone asks you on a date, you'll know, do I want to go? Do I like not want to yeah. go? You'll just know automatically. If you feel like you're kind of forcing it, then I mm-hmm. I think it's pretty much a given. Like, you're not ready. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question, like, when you know, you'll know. Yeah. Like, when and someone it- asks you and approaches you, sorry, on a date, if you're questioning it, you're probably not ready. Yeah. And they're going to see that energy. I had actually talked to um, uh, Amara about this, that energy is so big and people can sense it. You can be the least attractive person in the room, but if you have the biggest heart and the mm-hmm. most open-minded, you are going to be the most beautiful person in someone else's eyes because they are going to feel that energy and like they're going to see that mm-hmm. through you. And that's what makes you attractive. It's not your looks. It's and your when energy. you're not mentally ready to be out, you know, trying to date guys or talk to guys because you have a lot of self-reflecting to do, you have a lot of issues you need to fix, you know, you have your own things going on in your life. They are going to see that whether you think that or not, yeah. they will feel and sense that energy. I personally have been in a situation where I was trying to force a relationship and I was talking to a guy, but I was not mentally there. I was not physically there. I you know, was going through a lot and I was portraying that anger or whatever issues I was having on him without even realizing it to the point to where he left me and he was just like, yo, like, I can't do this with you. And I was Mm -hmm. so frustrated and angry at him. And then whenever a couple months later, I was like, you know what? I did some self-reflecting. I was like, wow, like, I feel so bad that I put him through that because I wasn't ready, you know? Yeah. My number one thing I always say is try to be a positive energy no matter who you're around, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Even if you're having doubts or feeling off about something, 
maybe keep that for when you're at home because you never know if your energy is off and you're feeling negative, it will affect who you're around and you can bring others down. But if you are a positive, radiant energy, people will know. I have actually had people come up to me out before being like, wow, I love your energy. One, it it brings new friendships. It could also bring people who you want to date and it also can uplift others mood, other people's moods that you don't know that yeah. need it. Yeah. No, I definitely, I try to stay home and I try not to talk or text people while I'm down or mm-hmm. sad just because I don't want to be seen yeah. in that light. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you are good at that. You always tell the, me that. <laughs> the other day I made a mistake and I went with you on that date while I was really upset about something else and I ended up talking trash about someone. Like now after the fact, I'm just like, that's not who I am yeah. as a person. You feel like I feel, an idiot. and you I should, not yeah. just an idiot. I feel bad because it's outside of my character. Mm-hmm. And so I know per se when I'm in a bad mental state, I'm not going to go out and be around people again because it makes me act out of character, and that's mm-hmm. that's not who I am. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you for listening mm-hmm. to today's episode. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing about my experience, their experiences, and I hope you learned something or at least found my trauma entertaining (laughs) um i don't know if you guys wait they have seen me cry before in the when my instagram got deleted (laughs) Uh, i didn't know that even happened i was was gonna say yeah it's like a popular screenshot people made me it's really funny um i want to see it so you may have seen me cry before this could be the first time regardless make sure you head over to apple podcast or spotify and subscribe to us make sure you subscribe on youtube um leave positive uplifting comments don't be a don't be a a bully seriously we drop three days earlier on apple so listen to us there (laughs) love that little dance (laughs) i'm like (laughs) bye